So whilst we've talked about the Apollo ground tracking stations, it's a little known fact that there were other tracking stations as well. There are a whole bunch of ships so that they could have movable tracking stations at sea. And these mobile tracking ships were important because you only had a limited uh, uh, coverage area uh, from the ground tracking stations. They only had uh, three of them around the world. So there were enormous gaps in the coverage for Apollo when it was in Earth orbit. So they had to do all those uh, you know, rendezvous tests in Earth orbit, the various Apollo missions all up there in Earth orbit orbit and well you can't do that from just three ground tracking stations it's not possible to get 100% coverage so they deemed that they needed more coverage so they had a whole bunch of ships that they could move around but ships are pretty slow so they invented the ARIA system airborne tracking stations so everyone knows about the uh, three main tracking stations but how do we track things in Earth orbit, the uh, closer stuff. Obviously, the three ground stations weren't good enough, so we're going to uh, talk about Project ARIA, and I'm here with uh, Stan Anderson, and tell us all about ARIA, Stan, from uh, what, what you worked on there and how ARIA works. Okay, uh, well, as he's already said, my name is Stan Anderson, and back on the Apollo project, I was in the United States Air Force, and NASA used, uh, had modified eight airplanes, Boeing 707s, uh, with a big dish antenna in the nose, a two meter dish antenna in the nose. And uh, NASA would tell us where they wanted them to, the airplanes to be and what time we had to be there. And our, it was our job to get there. I was the uh, sergeant in charge of the control center. But during the actual missions, I actually had the responsibility of making sure every uh, aircraft had completed its pre-flight or pre-access uh, 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 checklist and so I had to kind of keep track of all of all the airplanes that were flying at the time. We had eight, but we always kept two in reserve. So, uh, but we had six aircraft and they'd be scattered around uh, individually. We might have two at Ascension Island in the Atlantic, in the South Atlantic. And then we could have them at Perth and Darwin. And uh, we had, we quite often used Townsville, uh, but uh, we flew from Okinawa and I mean, not Okinawa, Guam and Hawaii uh, wherever, like I say, wherever it was closest to where NASA needed us, uh, we would get the planes up and get them there. And um, uh, it was it was really really exciting, uh, mainly because uh, generally when they went to the moon, they would give the go for TLI translunar injection. They give that through Carnarvon, but once the plane left Carnarvon, the ground stations could only track the spacecraft for a minimum of about for a maximum of about six minutes. And that's if the spacecraft went right over the top. Otherwise, it was always something less. Um, but the airplanes flew at 30,000 feet, and we could track them for 10 minutes. And so what would happen is, uh, uh, after the spacecraft left Carnarvon, the next ground station was going to be in Hawaii, which is several thousand miles away. Well, the problem is, uh, they'd start burning the engine over Carnarvon, but then it would go over the horizon, and there was nothing there. And of course, they needed to know when the engine cut off and they had to, whether it was a good burn, they had to have to talk, the, to, talk to the uh, astronauts. And so generally they'd put one or two airplanes out there, mainly because at 10 minutes we can track it for 2,200 miles uh, on its way towards Hawaii. And so um, uh, that was one of our standards. But then the other thing we did was uh, we were the only means that arrived, that, uh, uh, that the uh, NASA had to talk with the astronauts after they came out of re-entry blackout. And so we always had a, uh, uh, at least generally three airplanes in the area. We'd have one in the middle. We'd have one two miles up, uh, two and a half, 150 miles uprange, another 250 miles downrange in case of an undershoot or overshoot. And uh, invariably, uh, once, the, uh, once they got the signal, uh, we could relay the astronauts' voices back to, uh, uh, back to Houston and they could talk back and forth. Uh, but any of that was, that was done in the recovery area was strictly done through the airplanes. And that's why NASA, uh, NASA uh, developed the airplanes to begin with. Now, the, the airplanes themselves, we worked on a lot of other scientific projects. Uh, and um, I think all in all, through the life of the airplane, which believe it or not, one plane actually flew for 34 years wow. supporting space programs uh, with constant upgrades to the equipment inside. Um, but we originally started for Apollo, uh, well, basically everything up to Apollo 12 uh, to get the, um, 
uh, to get the signal back to Houston, we'd, bring, we'd catch the, uh, the signal coming from the spacecraft through the antenna in the nose, and then they'd run the signal out on a high frequency 100 meter antenna behind the airplane, and we had three stations around the world, or we had three contact points. One was the Overseas Tele Telecommunications Corp, uh, Commission here in Australia, and we had a station in Guam and a station in Hawaii, and all three stations would get the signal, and then they'd send it back to a technician uh, at Cape Canaveral, and he would select the best signal to go forward to, uh, to Houston. And it was the same way coming back. And so we, um, uh, we managed to work it. Then on Apollo 13, uh, we actually used a satellite antenna the first time uh, in the airplanes. Uh, we used a satellite to, re to transmit the voice. And then in Apollo 14, they used the antenna to, translate, to transmit the biomedical data back to Houston. And they found it was so pure when they got there, it was dropping like one bit in a billion. It was so pure, they used it to drive the medical computers at, uh, at Houston. And I left the project after Apollo 14, but I believe at that point, they, at that point high frequency radio went, went, the way of the, went the way of the ox cart um, because, of course, we had uh, satellite communication. They'd already demonstrated both voice and, and data, and that was, the way, that was the wave of the future. And so for the last three missions, by 15, 16, and 17, they were probably pretty well using uh, satellite tracking uh, satellite data to right. get it back to Houston. And they had a bunch of ships too, didn't they? Tracking they had, they had uh, three ships that were configured like the ground stations that had the big uh, nine meter antennas on them. And um, uh, they also had one, one that didn't have nine meter antennas, but they used that one strictly in the recovery area uh, because by that time they could, when, they, when, they, when the spacecraft got close enough to the earth, they could use regular VHF and UHF uh, to talk to it. Uh, they didn't need the unified S-band. Now, the, uh, another interesting thing was that these ships, uh, they, were, they were, you know, they were pretty, once they'd send them out, they'd send them out two, or three, two, two weeks ahead of time or 10 days ahead of time to a certain position where they needed them, but they had to get their tape back too. So what they would do is we actually worked out procedures where, um, where an aircraft would, would fly, would make contact with the ship and fly it over and then the ship would replay their tapes and the aircraft would record them, uh, just like they were recording the spacecraft. And so then they'd get records, and they'd, the planes would keep on going and drop the uh, drop the tapes that they'd made uh, at some convenient airport where they could fly them back to, to Houston. Nice. Now you were. Uh, can you tell us about the unified um, S-band antenna? More technical details on that, because that was in the nose. It was completely steerable. Yeah. Um, and it had other antenna arrays on it as well, did it? Well, it had two. It had four VHF antennas, one in each quadrant of the of the of the dish. And so, what would happen is, as soon as the spacecraft came over the horizon, um, the 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 first antennas to receive it would be the VHF antenna, and they merely simply balanced the signal on all four antennas. And at that point, the high-speed USB antenna, which was used for data transfer and stuff like that. Uh, was um, was ready to go, and then they'd set gyroscopes going, and then wherever the however the plane went, the the antenna would continue to follow the spacecraft. Now most people think that uh, most people think that uh, when you get data from a spacecraft, it's coming down as a single single channel, like you get your audio and you get your video and stuff like that. In reality, uh, it's more like a waterfall of data because the spacecraft is transmitting on so many frequencies. Um, that our aircraft could con would monitor, uh, basically, they could record 26 frequencies simultaneously with data. Uh, mainly, they actually had 28, 28 channels, but uh, they had to use uh, two recorders, and one, one, one track on each recorder was for timing. And so, uh, uh, yeah, there was a lot of data that came down that most people never heard of or stuff like that, and that's why they're still distilling a lot of that data today because it was just so much that was sent down 50 years later. So they could uh, record data on the planes as well as transmit and and so they could do real-time telemetry uh, between uh, Houston or any other ground station and... After, I would say after Apollo 15. Oh, after yeah, Apollo after 15. Yeah, after Apollo, because until that time the only thing we could retransmit was voice. Oh, okay. Yeah, right. you see, the so only thing... it was thing we, a receiver really, was it? Basically it was a receiver. We, uh, because... 
uh, we didn't have GPS at the time, so it was really kind of a crapshoot as to where the plane actually was, although they could get it really close to where it was supposed to be. But it wasn't accurate enough they could use it to transmit commands uh, to, the, uh, to the spacecraft. That could only be done from the ships and the, uh, uh, the ground stations. Of course, now you have to understand that our, we had a couple of uh, very distinct advantages over the ground stations. Uh, the first is, of course, we had a much better, uh, much easier uh, acquisition uh, to, to get hold of the spacecraft when it came over. But another one was that uh, we, because we flew at 30,000 feet, we could track the spacecraft for about 2,200 miles for over 10 minutes, whereas the ground stations were only could see it for about uh, six minutes, which is about 1,300 miles. But the other thing was, our, unlike the ground stations, our, our stations could move at 500 miles an hour. Yeah. And turning. And, and turning. And, and, yeah, dime. that's right. Yeah. Uh, and actually, a good example of how that came in handy was during Apollo 13. Uh, after the astronauts got set up in the lunar module to come home, the first people that NASA called were us at Araya Control. And they says, where can you get the airplanes? We said, how long have we got? They said, four days. We says, any place in the world you want them. And so, because uh, as it turned out, they, they brought the spacecraft down fairly close to where they originally wanted to bring it down to begin with. And so we already had plans worked out for that. But had we had to move the planes to the Atlantic Ocean, uh, we, were, we were already working on plans to, uh, to transit uh, uh, Australia and the uh, Indian Ocean uh, and get gas at Cocos Island and then, and then move into where necessary. And we had tremendous uh, 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 cooperation from literally countries around the world, um, in including some that might have surprised you at the height of the Cold War. Uh, but anyway, they, um, uh, we had all, all sorts of words from countries uh, Around the around the equator, that says, "Hey, if you need to land here, you can do it." Right. And so, because that was the this the the some people say that Apollo 13 was a failure, but in fact, it wasn't a failure. It was probably one of the best successes because it showed how people could come together, totally. and as a team, whether they were part of the team or not, they could come together as a team to to, to meet the needs of an emergency. That's it. And so, yeah, it was actually. So I always tell people that. Um, uh, well, the, the other thing I like to tell people is the uh, Manned Space Flight Center, which was consisted of 11 ground stations and four ships and, and, and the eight airplanes. Uh, NASA, uh, that was called the Manned Space, uh, Man Space Flight Network. Basically, it was NASA's telephone company. Nice. And uh, they had their own telephone company, special built just to talk with the astronauts. But that also means we were the first wireless company, too. And so, uh, um, but... Um, uh, it was, it was uh, like I say, but it was a huge, huge team effort. Yep. And um, I like to uh, point out in the words of a, a, a friend who's long, uh, long died a number of years ago. Uh, he says, when you, consider the, when you consider the magnitude of the task that we were given, uh, to put a man on the moon and bring him back, and when you consider the fact that the state of technology at the time, the only people with... Uh, the only people with personal communicators were Captain Kirk and the crew of the Starship Enterprise. And when you consider the real-time challenges we had to overcome, because if things went broke, they had to be fixed right away. Uh, and when you consider the fact that we put men on the moon not once but six times, the best way to describe it is, but we did it. We did it. We Absolutely. did it. Absolutely. And you were telling me a story about uh, one of the Aria planes. A friend of yours bought the moon rocks back. Yeah, yeah. Um, on Apollo 11, on Apollo 11, we had uh, one of our airplanes, Araya 7. Uh, we all named them one through seven, uh, or one through six, or one through eight. How many ever? But Araya 7 was a backup airplane, and the reason is is because um, every time the earth, every time the satellite goes around the Earth, the ground track shifts about 1,350 miles to the to, to the west, and so. Uh, Normally, the, the signal to go to the moon the, the, for TLI, the, the go for TLI was given through Carnarvon on Rev-3. Every Apollo mission went on Rev-3. However, they had as a backup capability that if something delayed them, they could go on Rev-4. Well, of course, that's great, except now all of a sudden your ground track is, ground track is shifted. And so uh, what happened was this Araya 7 was sitting at, at Guam, ready to take off if he needed to, but didn't need to. So on his, way, on his way back to the United States, a few days after the mission uh, was over, 
as he flew into Hawaii, they says, oh, we've got a special mission for you. We want you to take the moon rocks back to Huntsville. And so the mission controller, who was the officer in charge of the back end crew, uh, got the box, and they says, don't let this out of your sight. So we sat next to it for 11 hours all the way to, all the way to Huntsville. And, um, but that was one, of, I mean, heck, we were originally cargo planes to begin with. And one of the neat things was, of course, we, we supported a lot of missions before uh, outside of Apollo. Some were military missions, but some were uh, commercial and some scientific and stuff like this. Uh, I think the airplanes, fall, uh, the project, all of the airplanes con consolidated, con uh, covered about 59 different pro uh, 57 different projects uh, in, the, in the space because the last one flew into, uh, we brought it on board in January of 1968 and it flew into retirement in 2000. That's incredible. I mean, it really is. Wow. And uh, um, well, for, we kept the airplanes updated. Just the uh, just the fact that uh, we could we could do it that long. So, what was the uh, beam width on the unified S band dish? How uh, big our, was okay, it? okay. Now on our um, on the airplanes, we had a two degree beam width. And the best way to think of that is to think of a a, a flashlight in the fog, yep. or a torch uh, <laughs> Thank in you. the fog. <laughs> I have to translate, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. and so, yeah. but if you think of a beam in the fog, that was where you actually could get the high speed data. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, beam width, by the same token, on the nine meter uh, antennas that they used around at the other 11 stations uh, was, um, or uh, yeah, in the four ships, the three ships, uh, that was that was seven tenths of a degree. Yeah. Now, if you hold your if you hold your thumb against the horizon, that's one degree, yeah. and so. Um, the, uh, as a way of thinking. And then the, uh, uh, the 26 meter antennas that they used at, uh, uh, to talk to the moon uh, from uh, Honeysuckle Creek and uh, right Madrid. Yep. Yep. And, and Madrid and Goldstone in California, which is down in the Mojave Desert uh, near Barstow. Uh, but that, that beam width was only three tenths of a degree. Wow. And then the big, the big, uh, big antennas uh, the, the huge ones, I forget, what are they, 74? 70 meter. Right yeah, 70 there. meter. Those, those have a beam width of, of uh, one-tenth of a degree. Right. Pick the brightest star in the sky at night, yep. and that's about one-tenth of a degree. Now imagine trying to appoint that, to appoint that width in the, in the, uh, uh, in the sky to find the, to find the Voyager spacecraft, which is outside the, the solar system. I've done a video on that, talk, using that dish over there yep. to talk to Voyager 2. Sure. Uh, we, we had we could we had acquisition because the planes were used for everything, yep. not just Apollo. Was it nine meter antennas? Uh, they had a uh, basically a seven tenths of a degree beam width, but the uh, VHF antennas had a forty degree beam width. A forty degrees. Even though the, even though the little the antenna in the middle yeah. was um, was only two degrees. Yep. The uh, the high speed the USB antenna. But the VHF had 40 degrees. So when you start, and then in addition, we could sweep, we could sweep side to side, up to down, and any, you know, anything. Yep. So we didn't have any trouble finding a spacecraft. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, but that was one of the advantages that we had over the over the big stations because it was so small. It was, and then hey, and worst part, if you couldn't find it, then turn the airplane. And, uh, <laughs> Easy. It's fantastic. And uh, so awesome. Thank you very much, Stan, for that uh, little known history about um, uh, Apollo. Well, what's, what's, what's frustrating is that, I, from our perspective, a perspective is that it's always cut out of, uh, although the term Araya was used not too, uh, not too infrequently among, you know, on the various missions, the only picture, it's, uh, the only time it shows has been shown up is in the most recent 2019 edition of uh, Apollo 11. There you go. And right at the end, he's calling, he's calling the Houston through Araya and Araya 4. And, uh, but you're right, it's, it's here we are. Uh, R8 airplanes, when you consider the entire network, had 25, had 25 things. R8 airplanes comprised almost a third of the network, and wow. nobody's ever heard of them. But no. we were the telephone company. Who ever hears about the telephone company? <laughs> NASA telephone. So, Terrific. And okay. wireless. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you very much, Stan. Okay. See ya.